Okay, I think everybody's about done or close to it. Um, if you still have a couple more flips to do, you can just uh, <clears throat> do that as we finish up or as we start talking. So, first of all, um, just a quick poll. How many people ended up with every with 100% of one or 100% of the other by the end of it? Okay, yeah, so it seems like a lot of people. Okay, now, now in particular for the A's, um, if you had the A activity, how many people ended up with 100% recessive? Okay, so let's see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, so we had 15 people that were 100% um, little a. Um, how many people ended up with some mix of littles and bigs in the a's? Um, whether it's 50-50 whether or 25-75, whatever it is. 1, 2, 3, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Um, and then how many ended up with 100% um, dominant in the little a's? 1, 2. Okay, cool. All right, what about for the bees? So for the bees, who ended up with 100% recessive in the bees? Two two people again. Um, what about some mix? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. And then how many people ended up with a hundred percent dominant on the bees? One, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, and then lastly for the T's, how many people ended up all dominant? Everybody's homozygous tasters. Uh, one, two, three, four. How many people ended up with some mix in the T's? Okay, one, two, actually, sorry, let me give you this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Um, okay, and how many people ended up with all recessive non-tasters in the T? Interesting. Okay, just three. All right. Huh. Um, <coughs> that's actually kind of surprising to me, although maybe not, uh, Okay, yeah, anyway, this is the first time I've tried doing it this way. Um, so, what's, the question is, what's going on here? In particular, there's some, there's some weirdness. There's some things that should, should be at least a few people, maybe four people, felt like things got a little bit weird for them um, uh, because they ended up with the population filled with the, the damaging, diseased allele and 100% of that. Um, so, um, but... Let's actually, before we talk about the ones that have the damaging diseased allele, let's sort of, let's just talk about the T case. Let me get this out of the way. Come on. So um, the way the activity was set up was th there was no, um, there was no um, um, reproductive advantage, no survival advantage, um, no reason why um, somebody should, uh, w w no reason why um, you would expect to have um, some advantage to being able to taste or being unable to taste. Um, and yet, probably almost everybody at least had some fluctuations, even if you didn't end up at one final homozygous everything, right? Did, is there anybody who's like, was it 50, 50, 50, 50 the whole way for the T's? Okay, just a couple people. We're at 50% the whole way for the T's. Um, so most people, there was evolution going on. There were changes in the allele frequency happening. Um, and yet it wasn't because of natural selection. It wasn't because of, um, uh, it wasn't because of um, reproductive advantage. There weren't new people who can't taste arriving in the population. Um, the people who can taste weren't leaving the population. There were no mutations happening. And yet still, the population was changing and evolving over time. Um, so why is that? Why did the population change? 
I guess actually let's, let's take maybe two, three minutes and talk to your neighbors about why there was any evolution at all in the first place in the, in the tasters. And I'm um, sorry, one other thing to discuss is if we had done this with 200 people of each type and the population is stated a group of, 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 of 400 in size, um, then what would you expect would happen in that case as compared to this case with a small population? <coughs> Okay, so um, I think most of the groups have finished up uh, talking about this and are continuing to enjoy the popcorn. Um, <clears throat> so, why is evolution happening in this population here? There's no survival advantage, there's no reproductive advantage. Why is evolution happening? Yeah, sure. So, so yeah, genetic drift in a small sample size, what, what does that mean? Yeah, so, so, right, so random, um, uh, random alleles passed on. Um, and so, yeah, this, this um, is um, critically important in small sample, in small populations. Uh, so one, one other thing um, to, to think about is uh, in our example from Monday, um, when we had, for, uh, for example, when we were talking about the A gene, where the dominant, um, uh, dominant trait caused a 50% chance of dying before you could reproduce. Um, after one generation with a large sample, just sort of assuming that everything worked probabilistically, in our large sample, um, we went from 50-50 to 60-40, um, um, which is a pretty dramatic change evolutionarily in one generation. In, excuse me, in one generation to, to change allele frequency from 50% to 60%. Um, but if we followed that out for five generations in that large sample size, um, what we would get is the next generation we'd have something like 67% big A, and then the next generation like 71%, and then the next generation like 75 or something. So in five generations, with that huge selective pressure that half of the big A's are dying, um, we only get 75% um, of the population change. Um, I'm actually a little bit surprised that we didn't have a few more people in this ca camp here. I was sort of expecting more people to have homozygous <laughs> dominant, but anyway. Um, so, um, but in a small population, um, in this case, where we don't have to worry about any selective pressure, any, any survival advantage, um, just random chance, just dumb luck decides what the, the genes are going to be, and the genes can become, uh, mo uh, actually, surprisingly not most people. I expected almost everybody to have homozygotes by the end. Um, but, um, <coughs> but a lot of people in, in just five generations had completely homozygous tasters or completely homozygous non-tasters. If we surveyed the alleles across the whole class, we would probably still be at 50-50 for the T's, right? The, um, if we did, if we count up everybody's alleles across the class, we'd probably still be at 50-50. So in a large sample of the whole class added together, we don't have evolution. But in a small sample of two individuals per generation, we have pretty rapid, strong evolution. 
So, that, so this can be very rapid, and this is a, um, a strong force, a strong evolutionary force. in small populations. Does that, what questions do people have about that? Okay. Um, okay, so what about with, uh, with, let's say, the A allele over here? So um, a couple people ended up with homozygous big A. Um, that should seem weird. Um, so I guess maybe let's take like one or two minutes and discuss with your neighbors um, why is it weird that anybody had a homozygous big A's as 100% of their population considering the setup? Um, and then secondly, why is it maybe not weird? So what is the reason why you would think it would be weird? And then what is the reason why, it pro why I expected at least that a few people would reach that state? <coughs> Okay, so, um, so let's uh, come back and discuss together as a class. <coughs> so, um, so why is, it, why, is, why is it maybe unexpected that we would have some homozygous big A's? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so the A is lethal half the time. That's... You know, if, if there was some gene that I had running around in my genome that gave me, that had a 50% chance of killing my kids, um, then I would be really freaked out about that. Um, that, is a, that is a very significant, huge evolutionary pressure, um, I, I get working against that big A allele. <coughs> we talked last time about how sometimes you can have something like that that persists because of sexual selection if only... Um, individuals who carry the big A allele um, are mating, or if they're preferentially mating, then there might be competing evolutionary forces. Um, but in this case, there wasn't any competing evolutionary force in terms of mating selection. So, but yet, I went into this activity actually expecting more people than we had to end up homozygous, to end up with 100% uh, uh, big A. Um, and so why did I expect maybe five people to end up like that when we did this? Sure, yeah. Um, right, so it's only 50% of the time that the A is lethal, um, but it's 50% of the time that the A is lethal when we have a population of 1,000, and yet I don't expect, if we have a population of 1,000, to see in five generations that we end up um, completely set. But you're, but, you're, but you're on the right track in terms of it's, 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 um, uh, it involves luck. Yeah, sure. Well, um, if two heterozygous mate, then you have 75% of their being a big A in the offspring. Right. And before you do the whole like carbon dominant um, uh, if two homozygous dominant um, uh, individuals mate then there's a hundred percent chance of having A's in the offspring and then they're even more likely to pass on the A anyway so overall just the dominant is here to that's true it's, it's more the dominant trait is more likely to, to end up there when you start out with an equal um, we start with equal numbers of alleles you are more likely to see the dominant trait in 75 percent of the population um, but still you would sort of imagine that um, if one quarter are always living, then at most you're going to be talking about, so it would be maybe two-thirds have the dominant trait and one-third have the, do have the recessive, uh, or homozygous recessive after the dying happens, something like that. Um, but then 
Um, in a, in, but then in the next generation, we still have a lot of carriers for the recessive trait. And if they pass that on, those are all going to live. Um, so we still should see, we still sort of have an expected return of fewer and fewer big A's every generation, May, uh, so, which would mean fewer and fewer homozygous dominant. Does that kind of make sense? So, so you're right that the trait gets a little bit more common, at least initially, before it starts to decrease. Um, but but um, but it's not. Um, but but the allele should still be decreasing, and um, and we'd expect. I mean, we do expect what we saw here, which is more more homozygous little a's, right? Um, so we still, don't, I think, fully have an answer for why anybody ended up with heter homozygous dominant everywhere. Um, yeah, sure. So is it because of the sample size? Are so looking at such a small sample size that the population <coughs> is more likely to be in flux, whereas if we had a larger sample size, it could reach equilibrium easier? Yeah, yeah. So um, right. So I mean, it's, it's exactly this issue. It's 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 exactly the same answer as this here, which is that in a small sample size in a small population, random chance dominates. Random chance is a way stronger evolutionary force than even a 50% chance of death. Um, and in fact, you could, uh, you know, if we had a larger class of a thousand people, I could set it up with 90% chance of dying if you have the big A, and still a couple people would end up with everybody, with with all the individuals in their population having homozygous big A. Um, uh, so. The selective pressure comes into play, and that's why we see more homozygous recessives than homozygous dominance. Um, but in a small, in an individual small sample, you might, by random chance, get stuck with this bad gene stuck in the population. Um, so, so we have small populations. So, in other words, in small populations. Genetic drift, evolution by random chance, is way more powerful than most than, than natural selection or other part, types of evolution most of the time, right? One exception would be if it, if they had a gene that kill, killed killed a hundred percent of the kids then genetic drift doesn't come into play so much because if you're killing 100% of the dominant carriers, then only little a, little a is surviving. So that's sort of a trivial situation where, um, where it wouldn't work out. But, um, but even if you're killing 50, 60, 90% of the population, um, with enough genes or enough populations that are small, you're going to, by chance, have some bad genes ending up 100% of the population. What about for, for the B allele? Um, so for the, for the B allele, we actually had a little bit closer distribution in the B, in the B genes, uh, in the two B alleles, um, uh, between the homozygous uh, uh, deadly and the homozygous healthy case. Um, but again, why, are the, why did we have any, any, why did anybody end up, why are there two, two people in the class that ended up with their entire population all recessive? Sure, yeah. Yeah, kind of the same thing, right? Random chance. Yeah, two, you know, four tail coin flips on the first round, and that's it. Your population's little b forever after that. Um, so, um, so there's a 25% chance. That's kind of why I'm surprised that, uh, that this didn't happen a little bit more. Um, uh, actually, I guess there's a little bit less because we have to account for the fact they're dying. But there's, you know, there's, there's um, uh, <coughs> you know, something like, um, even in the first generation, there's something like a 10% chance that every individual after the first generation is going to be homozygous recessive. Um, and so, uh, and so there's, um, there's a good chance over five generations that you sort of fluctuate around and end up at this point of everybody being recessive. Does that make sense? Qu questions about that? Um, okay, so I actually wanted to... to um, Show some uh, some slightly more sophisticated simulations. Um, this is taken from out of the textbook. Um, uh, actually, taken, sorry, taken from a different textbook. Um, but uh, but it talks about um, uh, so in smaller populations, um, there tends to be more genetic drift. 
Um, and that is just fluctuations simply by chance. Um, so in a population with four individuals that's shown up at the top in one simulation, um, there's no, this is like the T case where there's no selective pressure, there's no, there's no survival pressure. Um, but it, within, within five or six generations, the population was completely homozygous for the dominant allele. If they ran in, in panel B, they did the same simulation with a population of four people over and over again. Each line of a different shade of blue is a different simulation. And in all of the simulations, by 20 or 30 generations, the population had 100% of one allele or the other. There's some fluctuation that goes on in the middle. You can sort of see the randomness a little bit. Um, but by, but after, after 20 or 30 generations, every single population of four is stuck with 100% of one allele or the other. Um, and this means that there's, of course, less genetic diversity. Um, and that's one reason why small populations um, are um, potentially at risk, or another, or another way to say that is why inbreeding is um, potentially risky and unhealthy. Um, so even if the gene that we're tracking has no evolutionary benefit right now, it could be that next week some industrial um, waste dump containing phenothiocarbamide and some other stuff ends up in a river somewhere. And so those individuals with big T are at a big evolutionary advantage. But if our population has already, by random chance, because it was small, s um, reached a point where there's no diversity at this gene and everybody's homozygous for not tasting, even though it didn't matter to them before, now the environment changed. And when the environment changed, um, they, uh, the lack of genetic diversity um, can destroy the population as opposed to maybe only killing off 25% of the population or something like that. Does that make sense? Um, OK, and so then panel C and panel D here um, illustrate if there are larger populations, there still is genetic drift that happens. Even in a population of 400 individuals, over 100 generations, this is still just all random chance. Um, there are a couple times where um, we get nearly 100% um, dominant or nearly 100% recessive alleles in our population. Um, <coughs> there's still some, some randomness. Um, but if you compare panel C to panel B or panel D to panel B, um, then it should be pretty clear that in a larger population, genetic drift is less of a significant force. And then in that case, it starts to matter more natural selection and sexual selection um, that we talked about last class period. Yeah, so what questions do people have about that? Sure, yeah. Just wondering, so will inbreeding decrease the risk of getting dominant disease? Inbreeding can, I don't think it, well, I don't know that it changes so much the risk of dominant disease, because dominant disease, yeah. Uh, in my, in my opinion, uh, that the inbreeding will increase the chance of homozygous. So, uh, so yeah. Well, dominant disease is expressed whether you're homozygous or heterozygous. And actually, interestingly, um, and this is something, yeah, um, come back to that in just a second here. Um, uh, yeah, okay, questions about that? Okay, so a couple more things to say. So one of them is there's this question here. Um, I think I didn't, I didn't post these slides yet, but I'll add these on to the, to the uh, Blackboard site, uh, Canvas site. But um, um, genetic drift does not only occur in neutral mutations. In fact, and it, in advantageous or deleterious, a, a mutation that helps, uh, sorry, an allele that helps or an allele that hurts um, uh, can also be subject to genetic drift. And sometimes, even something with a strong selective pressure, like we saw in a couple examples today, can end up um, uh, losing out and, and, being, uh, and being completely gone. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I wanted to to spend the last five minutes talking about the topic that we sort of tab that I tabled last week, which was um, continuing on with meiosis and thinking about mistakes in meiosis. Um, <coughs> and we're not going to really get very far into this today, but we're going to start with it on Friday. 
Um, but one idea to remember from last unit, as we're thinking about mistakes in meiosis, is that for, for some genes, it turns out that the amount matters, that it makes a difference whether you're homozygous or heterozygous. There's not just dominant and recessive. There's actually what we call dosage dependence. I'll write that up. Which basically just means that um, for some gene, the phenotype um, of, dom of, of homozygous dominant is not the same as the phenotype of a heterozygote. That's actually the case for more genes than for which you see simple dominance, um, like we talked about primarily in the last unit. Um, and so where this comes into play and kind of relates back to, to Faye's question is, um, there's a particular mutation called FOXP2 mutation. Um, and in the FOXP2 mutation, um, there are two alleles, the functional allele and the non-functional allele. Dominant and, or the sort of, let's call them dominant and recessive. But there are three different um, uh, genotypes that you could imagine. Um, so most people are this. Um, there's a small family in, um, uh, in England and another small family somewhere else where some individuals are this. Um, and these individuals have severe language difficulties. Um, and then there's this, which is 100% of the time dead. Um, and so we don't see any people that have that. Um, so if you do a pedigree, it kind of starts looking dominant um, because it's so rare that we never see anybody like this. But in fact, what it is is it's incompletely dominant. Um, and you need two functional copies to get your brain to develop normally. One functional copy, your brain does pretty well at development, but some of the more challenging things like um, movement of fine muscles in the face and hands and speaking and understanding language are challenges. But if you have no functional copies, then your brain doesn't develop at all and you don't survive to be born. Um, and so, in fact, it is really a case of incomplete dominance um, where we end up just not seeing the homozygous recessive case because they don't show up in, because they don't, they're never born. Um, they're miscarried. Um, it was going to be like this, except if white flowers died before they were born. Um, and, so, um, and so for a lot of dominant diseases, it turns out that one bad copy is sort of bad because it messes things up, sometimes because it creates toxins or whatever. But even like Huntington's, if you have two bad copies of Huntington's, you're probably going to die pretty young and have much worse Huntington's than if you have just one bad copy. So for dominant diseases, which FOXP2 usually is sort of factored in as a dominant disease, um, the, the uh, um, uh, two defective alleles can be a problem. And so inbreeding is still a problem because you will have um, a better chance of ending up with, um, with, two, um, with two dominant disease alleles coming together, which is even worse than one disease allele. That makes sense? Any questions about that? <coughs> OK, so, um, so uh, you can actually just keep your activities if you want to just take them home and, and, and uh, think about them uh, over the weekend, or, or I guess not the weekend, over, over the next couple of days. Uh,